all recoveries are associated with recoveries in housing. Every one of them, except the Great Recession. This last one. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce my esteemed co-worker and co-author, Steve Gerstad. And Steve and I have been, we, we started about five years ago uh, following the Great Recession. We were determined to understand what this was all about. And we looked at the last 14 recessions. That's back through the uh, Great Depression. And mm, it's housing, 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 uh, together with mortgage markets. That's what really surprised us. And I'm going to, now, uh, I'm, we're doing a book for Cambridge University Press, and, you know, we're getting close to the finish line. Uh, the stuff Steve's going to talk about is new stuff that's not in the book yet. We have that chapter uh, uh, yet to write. And the, but, but I want to give you a little thumbnail sketch of kind of what we've been doing, and I'll only try to eat too much into Steve's time. Uh, but <clears throat> the, uh, the most imp single thing you can say about crises like the Great Recession and the Depression is that they are balance sheet crises. The reason why monetary policy doesn't work is because there's too many entities, banks and households, in negative equity. They're paying down debt. They're hunkering down, okay, uh, in protection mode. And the flows of, of spending do not behave the same. And, the same. and for the same reason, fiscal policy doesn't work. Okay, I, I had... Sixty years ago, I sat in Alvin Hansen's class at Harvard. Uh, he taught the uh, macroeconomics, and he said, well, you know, in, uh, in, in, in bad uh, depressions, monetary policy doesn't work. You have to use fiscal policy, and the proof that that works was that the increase in government spending in 1940-41 finally brought, them, brought us out of the depression. I'll tell you what's wrong with that. In 1940, we had had 10 years of balance sheet repair, lots of bankruptcies, lots of failures. The Homeowners Loan Corporation had uh, bought about a million mortgages and reissued them, marked them to market. Okay, so by 1940, the balance sheets were in pretty, pretty good shape. Then things start to work. Okay, if I were to show you just one slide about what Steve and I have been up to, it would be this. This is the last 14 recessions, and shown in uh, shadow are, are each of the recessions. <clears throat> Notice that the Great Recession, th this is uh, housing expenditures as a percentage of GDP. This is the most volatile component uh, in the national income accounts, housing. It's very volatile. Uh, and you see that in this chart. Now, the Great Recession, you'll notice that housing expenditures fall for what, what it, uh, I can't see <laughs> over there, but I think it falls for eight straight quarters before the recession begins. You might say, well, isn't that a lot of lead time? What are the policymakers doing? Why aren't they doing something about it? I'll tell you the problem. Suppose you were aware of it and you, and you moved to stop it. Then you would be blamed for the crash, you see. And uh, the <clears throat> so, so that is the, is the conundrum that we, that we face. And now look back here in the Depression, and you'll see why it is that it's the same old, same old. We had, Steve and I argue that the Great Depression was essentially a, a housing mortgage market uh, 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 balance sheet crunch. And the details are in the book. It's not proven. It's, the data are much better and more compelling in the Great Recession than they are to the Depression. If we only succeed in getting economic historians to, to completely re-examine 
uh, the Depression, we will have, I feel we would have succeeded. Notice here, though, uh, that housing almost always leads the uh, declines. There's a couple of spectacular false positives. Both of them had to do with war spending, the Korean War uh, and the Vietnam War. Uh, all recoveries are associated with recoveries in housing, every one of them except the Great Recession. This last one is the only one, if you want to call this one a recovery, okay? <clears throat> uh, this chart uh, shows you uh, the total value in trillions of dollars of, of all housing in the United States, okay? All, the, the entire stock of homes. Uh, and then, <clears throat> uh, down here at the bottom, you'll see debt. And in between is equity. That's the value of all homes minus the outstanding uh, mortgage debt uh, against them. This is a spectacular uh, balance sheet crunch. This is what high, uh, notice that, that you have debt going up somewhat less than proportionally to the value of all homes, and, and not necessarily going in price, you're building more. Okay, that's just total value. To some extent, particularly in, in, since 1997, of course, there's been, there was uh, a, a lot of price increases, but a flood of new homes coming in. Uh, that investment flattened in 2006 and started down. Notice that debt, the bottom, continues to rise. And you've got, today we've got 22 percent homeowners still in negative equity. They're not in a mood to spend. Uh, and you see the crunch then is on that equity. And, and notice here that in 1997, uh, Total home equity was uh, about a little over six trillion. Okay. Uh, yes, a little over six trillion. It fell below that. Finally, in, in 2012, we've risen above that. Fifteen years for home equity to get back to it where it was in 1997. Now, the smaller recessions, here's some. Here's four of them. You'll notice these, these are the same charts of, of value, uh, uh, debt, and equity. The crunch is far smaller. And in all of those cases, uh, the Federal Reserve did not lose control of housing stimulation through lowering interest rates. Of course, one of the reasons why it was pumped up in the first place was because of Fed policy. There's kind of a, uh, Steve and I identify what you might call a Fed policy uh, housing um, mortgage market cycle, okay? And it's, and, it's, and it's pretty regular. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Steve. Steve's a great guy to work with. He's a bulldog on data. And uh, it, it's been a tremendous pleasure now for five years, and we're, we're not finished, but we're going to finish the book. But we're not finished thinking. Thank you, Vernon. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I'd also like to thank David Knott and Amy Pelletier for the invitation to come and present it to this audience. It's a real privilege. Um, it's also been a great privilege to work with Vernon for these past five years. Um, we're, we, you know, he's so incisive with the questions and always keeping the research on track. So it's been a, a, a lot of fun. Um, what I'm going to talk about is, you know, Vernon's described for you the origins of the problem. We all kind of know that the problem came out of the housing market. There was an attempt to stimulate our way out of a persistent recession in 2001. Um, it was a shallow one, but uh, the, it, it was very difficult to get 
especially business investment going, so the Fed thought that they would try to stimulate the, the housing, well, they would keep interest rates very low, try to stimulate the housing market and get things going again, and that attempt went awry. And we wanted to understand, you know, what has happened in other countries that have faced similar circumstances. Um, so last night, Nick Gillespie mentioned that there have been a number of these instances in other countries, and we want to um, examine those and see what we've, you know, he, he actually mentioned the, the work by um, Carmen Reinhardt and Ken Rogoff, and they've gone through and looked at about 20 of these instances, and, but they've looked at them cross-sectionally. We, we want to look at them in terms of the sequence of events, the time series, and try to get some ideas about causality. What's moving first and what's moving later? They're just looking at things like, you know, we find that deep recessions are associated with deep declines in housing prices, but we'd like to know if they proceed or follow, if they're a cause or a consequence of the deep downturn. Um, they also look at the buildup of government debt that typically follows one of these deep downturns. We want to know where that's coming from. And it turns out to be pretty simple. Um, you know, you get one of these deep downturns, and there's about a 50% increase typically, uh, excuse me, about 50% of the increase in government deficits is coming from increased expenditures. A lot of them are just so-called automatic stabilizers kicking in. And then there's about half of the increase in deficits is coming from reduced tax revenues. And you know, so it's a consequence of the downturn, not a cause. And so when, when we look at the sequence of events, we can start to put together at least a qualitative model. You know, we don't have an analytical model like some of the macroeconomists have, um, but we also kind of know that those analytical models aren't very good. Um, there was a fellow from the Minneapolis Fed who was asked to testify before Congress about why they couldn't foresee the recession coming, and he, he said that um, the models aren't very good at predicting rare events. Um, his colleague um, ha had recent, just a couple years earlier published a book called The Great Depressions of the 20th Century. Um, so I, I just noticed, or just realized a few weeks ago that he had just kind of thrown his colleague under the bus <laughs> right in front of Congress. Um, so what I want to do is look at some of these episodes and compare two different approaches. So one approach is, you know, spearheaded, especially, I think the most, the most visible proponent of this would probably be Paul Krugman and perhaps um, Larry Summers. Um, and Nick had some quotes from both of them yesterday. Um, so Larry said that if the government borrows a lot, that that's going to help their credit, not hurt it. Um, maybe, um, but it's certainly, I, I, I don't think there's any evidence that it's going to help the economy. And that's kind of what we're interested in. Um, so here's a chart of real GDP in Japan over the past 36 years. Okay. The blue line in the middle is their GDP. It's on the left axis. I've, I've kind of intermingled revenue and expenditures uh, on, with a right axis scale and their GDP on the left axis scale. Um, and I think that's just, I've done that because you can see that there are really kind of three periods. There's a period of very strong growth um, from 76 to 90, and that period actually you know, extended back in the past um, into the late 50s. They had, they had a very, very strong growth for about 30 years and maybe 35. And then they had an asset market bubble collapse in the equities market. So the Nikkei index peaked in December of 1989 at about just under 40,000. And the last time I looked, it was still under 10,000. Okay, so their, their equities market is worth about a fourth what it was worth now 20 years ago. 
Um, so soon they'll have to rename this thing, this episode from the lost decade to the lost quarter century or something like that. Um, and then there's a middle period following the crash of the equities market. Actually, the real estate market collapsed too. And their real estate market collapse has been much, uh, in some ways, much worse than ours. Uh, the, the, the last time that I looked, they had had 17 consecutive years of declines in inflation-adjusted values of, of homes, of residential structures. So that's, that's a really significant decline. Um, and, but they were, they were basically trying to patch over all the problems for about six years, and then they lost control of it in 97. And in 97, they began an even more aggressive, they essentially doubled down on this program of trying to increase government expenditures and reduce taxation. So I think that, you know, one thing that, there are a couple of things that this shows pretty clearly. Um, I think it's just very difficult for Paul Krugman and for Larry Summers to sustain their argument that you can spend your way out of these problems. Um, another thing that I think it shows is that deficit spending is probably quite harmful. And, and in conjunction with some other, other evidence that I'll show you from countries that have recovered sharply, I think there's even stronger, a stronger case that deficit spending doesn't help. Okay, so the, the, you know, the, this is the Democratic program up here. Let's increase expenditures. And here's the Republican program. Let's decrease taxes and stimulate the economy that way. And I think that there is evidence that it doesn't work, and there's a fairly simple reason that it doesn't work, which I'll be coming to later when we see what does work or what has worked in the past in some other countries. So I'm going to just now turn to some countries that have had similar crises and that have recovered. There's quite a bit of information on this chart, but there's a fairly simple uh, interpretation of it. We've just referenced everything to the first quarter uh, to, or to the peak of their economic cycle, which in this case was in the first quarter of 1990. And then all the numbers on these series are how things, how different sectors that were performing, yeah, uh, what the percentage change was for that sector from that start of the recession. Okay. So for example, investment was, this is fixed investment, so this would be residential structures and firms' investments in plants and equipment. And that was about 35% lower five years before, or excuse me, four years before the recession started. And it peaked just before the recession and then collapsed. And it collapsed so that at the bottom of the recession, total fixed investment was about half what it had been. Okay, so that's a very substantial collapse in fixed investment. And that's what we've seen in all of these serious episodes, that we've seen that the total collapse in fixed investment, so this is residential structures, um, office buildings, firms, new plants, and, and, and maybe manufacturing equipment that goes into those plants, those can actually quantitatively account for almost the entire downturn. And, and that this is consistent across recessions, uh, excuse me, across these very deep recession instances. And you know, further evidence of that is that here's this blue line is consumption of non-durable goods and services. And that's pretty close to flat. In the United States, that accounts for 60% of GDP. Okay, so, and in Finland, it was about 50, I think just slightly over 50% of GDP. So you've got a big part of GDP that's not moving at all, and something else has to be, you know, the, the causal factor, or at least the part of the economy that's, that's declining rapidly. And I'm going to just skip forward a slide and say a little bit more about this investment collapse. Um, it's very similar in its origin to the United States. So here's the price of residential structures in Helsinki. 
and also in Finland in general. So the Helsinki one is the black one on top, and Finland in general is below. They're both indexed so that they're 100 in 1970. And you can see that even by the time that the recession started in Finland, house prices in Helsinki had dropped from an index of about 204 down to something like 174. So about a 14% decline in housing prices before the economic cycle peaked. So that's consistent with you know, people taking out loans on an asset finding that that asset is no longer performing well and retrenching. And now the whole sector itself is going to decline rapidly. The construction of new homes and the, and the construction of other, uh, of other fixed investments is going to decline. And that was, you know, we know that that was true in the U.S. It was true in Finland and I've, I've got data that shows that it's true in almost all of these countries that we've examined that have had these serious downturns. So going back now and looking at this, we see they had a very sharp decline in total GDP. It was about 12.6%. That's the red curve or the red series. And their government deficits got very large. They ran into problems in their fiscal sector. They didn't have the, the depth of credit availability that the United States has or that Japan has. And they were forced into a retrenchment. You can see that before they even started to emerge from the depth of their depression, they had a sharp reduction in government expenditures. That's the black curve here. And it persisted for quite some time. It was really quite a long time before it even came back to the level that it had been when it peaked in the middle of the depression. So that's more evidence that you don't need a fiscal stimulus in order to, or so-called stimulus. It, it's even a misnomer from my perspective. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't help the economy, um, but it's not needed because we've seen a strong recovery in Finland. I mean, you can see that these growth rates were good and they've remained good. Their economy is more than 50% bigger than it was when their depression started in 1990. The total size of the Finnish economy has increased over 50%. The total size of the Japanese economy over that period has increased by 8%. So that's, I think, fairly strong evidence that this isn't a helpful response. What is helpful is that they had a sharp depreciation of their currency. And so what I'm going to turn to now really, um, you know, I'll, I'll show you some other countries and it reinforces the evidence that I've already shown you. But what I'm going to turn to now is what does help with repair in one of these balance sheet recessions? What is repairing the balance sheets? And that too is fairly simple. You know, as, you know, I think, you know, part of the, um, you know, the, the, I don't know what you call it, but you know, the, the reasons description is free minds and free markets. We should expect the free market to repair these problems in some way. We, we believe that they should, and in fact they do, and in a very particular way. If households are saturated in debt, if there's no room for you know, new investments um, in fixed structures, plants and equipment, houses and office buildings and so forth, um, that market's saturated, and you know the consumption spending of households can't increase a lot because people don't have the income to do that with. There's only really one place that the recovery can come from, and that's going to be the export sector. And it makes perfect sense because part of the problem with the fixed investment sector was that there was capital flowing in from the rest of the world. It was being used to, to provide loans that were bidding up the price of new structures and existing structures. And that's evidenced by this blue line down here. This is the current account deficit. It's really the same, it's essentially the same as the trade deficit with the 
modification that it also includes income flows on current debts and assets in the rest of the world. But you can think of it as, as being approximately equal to the trade deficit. And that was about 6% of GDP in Finland for a fairly long period of time. In the US, it reached just a shade under 6% in 2006 when we took in almost $800 billion from the rest of the world. And we were using that to bid up the prices of, of houses and they were, the, the mortgages on those houses were then bundled into mortgage securities and shipped off to the rest of the world. Okay. So we were accepting large capital inflows and that's been a typical part of these downturns. So what do they have to do in that circumstance? They've got to start repaying that debt. And the way you repay it is that you export more than you import. If you, then you're going to be earning all this money from exports and that can be used to pay down the existing debts and to build up assets. A lot of the discussion that goes on about what we need in order to recover, I think is kind of, um, is kind of all backward because people will talk about how we want to build confidence and then we, we're, going to, we're going to attract foreign investment. We don't want foreign investment. We want to be investors in the rest of the world now because we've been in a situation of having the rest of the world invest in us for about a quarter century. Um, and, and we have a, an accumulated amount of debts that we need to repay. So what happened in Finland is that they went from a 6% current account deficit to a 6% surplus, and very quickly. That is reflected in the exports. You can also see where part of the nervousness is coming from in the rest of the world because as a percentage of GDP and even in absolute terms, Finnish exports, this red line right here, were declining. But that's going to be what they need to repay all of the capital investments that have been made by the rest of the world. Um, their imports were about flat and their exports were declining. When their currency depreciated after the financial crisis, they quickly went into a position of very substantial trade surpluses and got export earnings. So when the rest of the world says, we can't give you any more capital, we don't have faith in your ability to repay this, they make their own. They export more than they import and they're suddenly generating the capital that they need. And in fact, what we typically see is a real spike in the exchange, in our, this is a collapse of their exchange rate when, when this graph goes up because um, it's, it's actually, worth me taking a moment to, to describe why this is inverted. Um, in about the middle of 91, they could take five of their Finnish marka and buy a basket of European currencies, but two years later, they need to take seven of their marka to buy those, so the value of the marka has fallen. But when the value of the marka falls, it's a lot, their, their exports are much more attractive to everyone else. It costs less for them to buy them. And imports from the rest of the world become more expensive to them. So they, um, you know, there's, there's actually not a decline in imports, but um, there's a, a rapid surge in exports. We're looking now into the dynamics of this recovery process and we have a lot of evidence that we're putting together that the increase in, in imports after a sharp depreciation is typical, but that it's coming from components that are a part of the exports. So their imports of consumer items tend to fall, but they tend to um, increase their exports, uh, their imports of, of components of production that go into exports. Um, that's also important in terms of trade policy. The last thing you want to do in response to one of these events is to, you know, add to tariffs or do anything that's going to obstruct that process of, of internationalization of production. And in terms of the, I, I think that covers the basics of the, um, of, of the export surge. 
And I'm just going to say one more thing here about their fiscal retrenchment, and that is that it was very sizable. They cut within two years from the bottom of their depression, they cut their total expenditures by 5%, and within seven years, they cut them by almost 16% of GDP. This isn't 5% of their total government expenditures, it's 5% of GDP, and 16% and within seven years. So for us, that would be about a $300 billion a year reduction year after year. And that should be the target. When, when people were talking, you know, even the Republicans were talking about expenditure reductions, and they said, we want to cut expenditures by a trillion dollars in 10 years. Um, they need to do a lot more than that if they want to be on the track that these other countries have followed. Okay, so I think that the goal has been set a bit too low. Um, and, you know, in terms of what happens to the export sector, I'm just going to run through briefly a, a simple example of it. So imagine that you have a Finnish forest products firm, and this firm uh, produces lumber that it sends to the United States. The market was four market to the dollar in 1992, and it quickly depreciated to six market to the dollar. So if they had one million dollars of exports to the United States, they would get four million marka back for that. All, almost all of their costs are incurred in Finland and say that those were 3.6 million marka. They've got about a 10% profit margin and they earn 400,000 marka. After it depreciates to six marka to the dollar, they get six million marka for those, for, for, for those same exports. And their cost structure isn't affected at all if, if you know, it's mostly you know, mills that are operating fin in Finland with power from Finnish rivers and they're shipping it on trucks that they have in Finland, bringing them to the port and so forth. So all their costs remain in Finland and now they've got a margin of 2.4 million marka. It's pretty substantial increase, about a six-fold increase in their profit margins. And we've already seen a couple slides back that they about, many of these countries have about doubled their quantity of exports. So their mar profit margins go up substantially and their quantity of exports go up substantially. So that's the source of the recovery, that's the engine of the recovery and that's how depreciation works. Economists have talked about these things as twin crises. In fact, Carmen Rogoff, uh, Carmen Reinhart and Graciela Kaminsky did this and they said that you know, you, you frequently find a financial crisis coupled with a currency crisis. It's a crisis for people who have taken on large amounts of foreign debt to build office buildings and to take out big mortgages on homes. It's, a, it's an opportunity for people who are engaged in productive activities. And I think it should be viewed that way. I think that by viewing the currency de decline as a negative, for people who have large accumulated debts in investments that are unsound. That's basically kind of backward looking. They're looking at protecting bad investments in the past. If they just let the currency go, then they're gonna be you know, looking at a way to progress. Did you even show the tie? Yeah, so as soon as the tie bot collapsed, then their exports surged. Um, you can see they actually went from about 40% of GDP to about 64% of GDP. And that happened in three quarters, nine months. You know, so, so something's going on. And in fact, you, know, you can see the kinds of places where it's going on. Here's the, t the Thai stock index, which peaked in 1994, collapsed, and, and, and the collapse only accelerated during the financial crisis, but here's one export-oriented firm and what happened to them. One of the things that we've seen, and actually in terms of an investment strategy that's very helpful, is that it takes the market a while to recognize this. They start to see the performance of these export-oriented countries and then the prices of the stocks get bid up. But when you look at what has happened to the revenues of the countries, those increase very rapidly. I'll give you another example from Iceland. Um, 
And here's, here's a company, Merrill Food Systems, they build, uh, they, they build processing equipment that goes on large ships for, fi for fish harvesting and processing. And their revenues quadrupled. Actually, you can see 2008 is the crisis year, and their revenues doubled by 2010. Um, I've been very careful to take out acquisitions. So they fortunately acquired a firm and then divested that same firm. And so, so this is on the basis of the same uh, the, the same operations. Their revenues doubled between 2008 and 2010, and look at what happened to their profits. You know, their profit margins went from under three to over nine percent, and that persisted because of the depreciation. So there's a real opportunity, and what we'd really like to do is instead of, you know, grubbing around and trying to find a few examples, sort of systematize this with, um, with somebody who, or with, with a firm that's, that is, you know, has the access to these data and can work on this problem.